Hello, science family. Today, we're going to be looking at mole stuff, which really is just, just an introductory idea to what is the mole and what does it do for us? So we're going to be answering the following questions about the mole, but also answering in proper units, meaning AMUs versus grams. Remember, if we're dealing with anything that has to do with moles, meaning a huge number of objects, we're going to be measuring mass in grams. If we're dealing with something that's an individual element, individual compound, not billions and billions of them, then we're going to be dealing in AMUs. So let's work through that to get an idea. So first of all, what is the mass of one atom of chlorine? So if I look off on the periodic table, on the periodic table I have, yours might be slightly different, they round to different places, but my periodic table says 35.45. But since I'm dealing with one atom, not billions of atoms, I'm going to measure that in AMUs. You wouldn't use that in grams. But if I said, what is the mass of one mole of chlorine atoms? Remember, one mole really means that there's 6.02 with those 21 zeros after it, because you'd move the decimal point 23 places to the right. That's a huge number of chlorine atoms. So still, I'm going to look on the periodic table. My number is still the same, 35.45. Only now I'm going to use grams because there's billions and trillions and trillions of them. Uh, I can That's measurable in the real world. So you might be thinking, I don't get it. How is the number the same, but the units are different? Well, is it different if I run five centimeters versus five miles? And you would say, yes, five centimeters is really short. Five miles is a decent run. Good job, right? Well... Just because they have the same numbers doesn't mean they're the same value because the unit changes that. That's what we're talking about with AMUs and grams. So that's why they're different. So let's take a look. What is the mass of one molecule of ozone? Ozone is O3 and it's one individual molecule. So that means we're going to need to take the mass of three of those oxygens. If you look at oxygen on my periodic table, each oxygen is 16. So 16 plus 16 plus 16 ends up getting me a total of 48 off the periodic table. But since it's one individual molecule, we're going to measure in AMUs. Now, number four says, what's the mass of one mole of ozone molecules? Which means one mole of ozone molecules is their 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of ozone. Well, that's trillions and trillions. So still, I have off the periodic table the 16s mass for each oxygen, which gives me 48. But remember, since I'm dealing with trillions and trillions of them, because I use the word mole, I'm now in units of grams. So again, both these answers were 48, but different units, just like 5 centimeters and 5 miles is very different. Keep that in mind. Looking at number five here, what's the mass of one mole of table salt? Well, if I look at table salt, I've got one sodium and one chlorine. So off my periodic table, sodium is about 22.99 for a mass. And chlorine, we already wrote down earlier, is about 35.45. So when I add those up, I get about 58.44. But here is the question. What units? Well, it says one mole of table salt, which means there's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of these formula units. So since there's trillions of them, that's going to be measured in grams. Also notice that this was called a formula unit, not a molecule, because it's an ionic compound. That'll be important to remember because our terms are slightly different. Anyways, if we look at number six, we want one formula unit of sodium chloride. Well, we still have just one sodium and one chlorine to look up the mass, and it's still 58.44, except since we're dealing with one individual compound, one formula unit, we're just dealing in AMUs, all right? If you take a look at number seven, how many total leprechauns are in a mole of leprechauns, all right? So if I have a mole of leprechauns, remember a mole represents a number. I have a mole of leprechauns, I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd leprechauns. How many raindrops are in a mole of raindrops? Well, if I have a mole of raindrops, 
I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd rain drops. That word represents that number. It's Avogadro's number. What about if I have a dozen cats? How many cats do I have? Don't be silly, guys. It's 12, right? It's not the same number. Don't be robots. Use your brain, right? There's 12. So remember, a dozen is a word that represents a number. That's super easy to us, so we need to get used to a mole being that comfortable as well. If I have a mole of dust, that means I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles of dust. The word mole represents and means 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. All right, so if I look at the back page here, balance the following equation and answer the question. Oh, good. This is a combustion reaction. I like these. Remember with combustions, I like to do carbon, hydrogen, and then oxygen when I balance. So four carbon there, I'm going to drop a four there. Eight hydrogen there, four times two will give me eight. Now, four times two oxygen gives me eight oxygen. Four times one oxygen gives me four. Eight plus four gives me a total of 12. So I'm gonna need six times two here to give me that balanced equation. All right, I'm gonna clean this up and now I've got my nice balanced equation of one, six, four, four. So the question is, how many moles of water molecules are created in this balanced equation? How many moles of water? Well, here's the water molecules. There's a coefficient of four. So there are going to be four moles of water molecules. Awesome. How many moles? of oxygen molecules are combusted. All right, here's my oxygen molecules. So that means six moles of oxygen molecules are going to be combusted. Remember the big numbers, the coefficients represent moles now. Well, they always have, but now we know that. Let's take a look at number 12. Let's balance this out. Two chlorine here, so I'm gonna put a two there. Now I've got my chlorines, but that's two Potassiums, I'm gonna need two potassiums there. It's gonna give me that, but that's gonna give me two bromine. I think I'm balanced. One, two, two, one. Now that I have that, the question is, how many moles of potassium bromide formula units are needed in this reaction? All right, well, if I look, I'm going to need two moles of potassium bromide to react with every, it looks like one mole of chlorine. How many moles of bromide molecules are there? All right, well, there's bromine by itself, right? Bromide. And it looks like I'm gonna need one mole of that because there's a coefficient of one. So you see how the balanced equation can help us figure out how many moles? Straightforward. Let's look at number 13 and let's not make it harder than it needs to be, all right? The word mole represents a number. And remember that big number, allows us to convert our periodic table into grams. Okay, let's balance this out. Whew, what do we got here? Uh, let's see. I've got one phosphate, one phosphate. Okay, three potassium, one potassium. So I'm gonna put a three there. If I put a three there, that's gonna give me three oxygen and three hydrogen. But I already have three hydrogen over here. So it looks like I have six hydrogens on the reactant side. So let me see if I drop a three here, Three times two will give me six hydrogens, but three times one oxygen gives me three oxygen, but I already have three oxygen over here. Wow, that was a good one. A little tricky at first, but I think I'm balanced with three, one, one, three. So let's take a look and it says, if 10 moles of potassium hydroxide are used, then how many moles of water molecules would be produced? Wow, okay. so. I've got 10 moles of potassium hydroxide. First of all, let's figure out what we're looking at here. Potassium hydroxide is KOH. Water is H2O. So if you look at, according to the balanced equation, for every three moles of KOH used, three moles of hydrogen, oh, I'm sorry, I was going to call it the compound name, water. Three moles of water are produced. So that's a three to three ratio. Isn't that even one to one? So if you started with 10 moles of potassium hydroxide, wouldn't that just mean then that how much, how many moles of water would be the same? Yeah, so you'd end up with 10 moles of water, 10 moles of H2O. 
So I used a little proportion there. That won't always work, but for this case it did. But you saw the ratio. For every three of potassium hydroxide, you get three waters. All right. It looks like we've got one more like this. I like this. We're stretching our brains a little bit. If I have 20 moles of potassium phosphate, which by the way, this is potassium phosphate, how many moles of potassium hydroxide must have been originally used? Okay, so I'm looking at that. So let's look at our ratio. For every three moles of KOH that is used, one mole of potassium phosphate is created. So it looks like there's always three times more potassium hydroxide to potassium phosphate. So if you know there's 20 moles of potassium phosphate, you need three times more of potassium hydroxide. Well, what's 20 moles times three times more? It's gonna be 60. So with using our ratios and a little straightforward math, it looks like 60 moles of KOH will be produced. Now, what you're doing here on question number 13 is some awesome, awesome math that we're going to use that's gonna help us throughout the next couple of weeks in chemistry. It's using these whole number ratios in the balanced equation to help us predict how much was used and how much is going to be produced. So there's just a little precursor, just a little taste test of what's to come. But nice job sticking with it, and we will continue to move onward and upward. Nice job, science fam. Best of luck.